there's something incredible about nostalgia. It's the driving factor on why we view our childhood so positively, thinking things were so much better when we were kids, putting on a pair of rose-tinted glasses when thinking about the past. You may have grown up playing LEGO games on your Xbox or Wii, and remember them as these flawless and action-packed adventures, while reliving events from your favorite movies. But this is far from the case. These games are not flawless, and the nature of their programming is what allows for some of the most frustrating, surprising, and wild skips seen in speedrunning. This is the world record history of LEGO Indiana Jones The Original Adventures. I don't think it's enough though. Two and a half seconds off. Alright, that was really good. Yes? Sub 149! For the world record! Get on my level! Get on my level, Zeddies! Oh, yes. Nice. That was a big gold. First time I guess I got both the jumps first try. <laughs> what? Dude! What? <laughs> Let's start with the basics. For those not familiar with LEGO video games, they're a brand of puzzle platformers that follow the events of whatever film they're based off of. In LEGO Indie 1's case, it's the first three Indiana Jones movies. The game has three main campaigns, each defined by its own movie, with six levels per, leading to a total of 18 levels in the Any% percent route. While there are three bonus levels, they're not present in this category. Each level has you playing as the main character, Indiana Jones, with a secondary character that usually has a special ability you can use to help get through the mission. These abilities can range from a higher jump to a specific type of weapon, like the wrench or the shovel. In Indiana's case, he's the only character in the entire game that can use a whip, which is usually used to cross large gaps or pull switches. It's a very simple premise for a game, and one that is very easy to exploit, which you'll see plenty of throughout these runs. Every run of this game starts out the exact same. You're forced to begin on the first level of Raiders of the Lost Ark, called the Lost Temple, or simply 1-1. After you beat 1-1, the rest of the movies open up, allowing you to beat them in whatever order you want. The earliest record of somebody speedrunning this game was on the 29th of December 2015. There are references to the first indie game on the Speed Demos archive, but nobody claiming to have actually ran the game or gotten any sort of record. It's likely that there were people glitch hunting and practicing attempts, but dropping the game for unknown reasons. Anyways, this first run was done by a runner named SM Kirky, with a finishing time of 3 hours, 2 minutes, and 18 seconds. It's worth noting that Kirky themselves remembers a 4 hour run being submitted before theirs, but it's no longer on the board. The run itself is close to what you would see in a casual playthrough of the game, with no dedicated strategies to help it go by any faster. That's not to say that there weren't some small time saves here and there, however, like jumping on top of this pillar in level 2-1 instead of building the monkey bars. Or, later in that same level, jumping off of invisible terrain to skip a large portion of the platforming. But those small time saves can hardly make up for the losses that were experienced. Because combat in these games is fairly stiff and linear, trying to do anything while being attacked will most likely result in your character's death, and nothing exemplifies this better than 1-3. While trying to blow up this silver barrel, SM Kirky gets mobbed by around 15 enemies, and misses the explosion several times, resulting in them having to stop, defeat every bandit, and then finally solve the puzzle. Needless to say, this was an unpolished first run, but one that leaves a lot of room for improvement later on down the road. One day later, Kirky would improve upon their time by 20 minutes. This can mainly be chalked up to having a better understanding of the levels being played, 
as well as adjusting the route from the day prior to help avoid these same time losses. Better management of the enemy sections, more commitment to trickier jumps, and better game knowledge would again help drop the time down by yet another 20 minutes two weeks later. This record, the 222, did have some new tech being used to assist in getting that record. Even though 1-3 City of Danger was still a long level, a new trick jump to bypass the ladder section where Kirky lost so much time was found. You can use Marion's high jump to jump off of the explosive barrel onto the monkey's balcony, then up to the transition zone, cutting off over a minute from the first record set. Later on in the same level, another trick jump could be used to jump over the fence blocking you from accessing this truck, as opposed to having to wait for the proper enemy to spawn to take their disguise, then use the door panel. While Kirky did miss this jump quite a few times, it still ended up saving time. 1-5 has a jump to skip the first room, a notably lengthy one. Instead of doing the whole song and dance of having to push this cart and platform across, you can make a precise jump off of this rock to get up to the ledge. The rest of 1-5 goes about the same, however, with the second room taking up a bulk of the level's time, with seemingly no way around it. Moving on to 1-6, we actually see one of the biggest skips that is still used in modern day runs. Right inside of the first room, you can make a jump off of this crate, onto the tarp, and then up to the transition. This is a much harder jump than it seems, however, as the tarp is what's considered sliding geometry. When you jump on top of something you're not supposed to, the game will sometimes mark that surface as slide, which, well, slides you off. In this state, you can't jump, attack, or do any action, and only very slightly influence your character's direction. In this jump scenario, there is one small corner of the tarp that won't slide you off, but you do have to jump off of it immediately, as standing still on that section for too long will still push you off. Luckily for the runners, you're able to buffer jumps in this game. If you jump in the air, then hold the A button before landing, the game will register that A press the second you hit the ground allowing you to jump on the first available frame to avoid being nudged off. As impressive as this jump is, that's really all there is to talk about in this level. Skipping ahead to 2-4 Free the Slaves, a new jump was implemented that allows you to skip a lengthy section of carrying the box across wooden platforms. Instead of doing that, you can do a carefully placed double jump as Indiana to get on top of this platform and swing across. Kirky ended up losing time on this trick, unfortunately, as the jump is very tricky to land. In fact, Kirky lost a lot of time on this level, due to the boss fight being very inconsistent, requiring you to throw an explosive at the boss so they drop a rock on their head. However, the explosive will sometimes just miss, or the rock just won't fall. Overall, this level was just very unfortunate. Kirky noted in the description of this run that sub-220 was entirely possible. They just needed to not mess up as much. You may have noticed by now that a lot of the cool tricks and discoveries were really only being found in Movie 1, and there was practically nothing being discovered in the last two films. This is mainly because runners were, at the time, playing through all of the movie before moving on giving them more time and familiarity with the levels themselves. But rest assured, the glitch hunting and optimizations were starting to bleed over. For the time being though, things would stay mostly stagnant. This 222 would stand for nearly a full year with no contest, until December 18th of 2016, where Kirky came back with a 7 minute improvement over their own record finally getting the sub-220 they had referenced 11 months prior. And after this accomplishment, SM Kirky would step back from LEGO Indiana Jones speedrunning, and hasn't been active for nearly three years, which paved the way for new runs to enter the scene. Meet Prince, a notable figure in the LEGO Batman speedrun scene. He would find an affinity for this game as well, and began his tirade on April 4th of 2017, 
But something was very different about his runs. Prince had opted to not play the game on PC, rather to pick up the Wii version of the game, and this was due to a couple of neat exclusive features. To make use of the console's motion controls, the Wii version of most LEGO games would often have buffs like Fast Build or Fast Dig associated with shaking the Wii Remote. If you were to do anything in this game, whether it's using a wrench, a shovel, or building, shaking your controller would greatly speed up the process. These games have a lot of building present, so you can see why this would save a nice chunk of time. There also ended up being other improvements to the routing, like the balcony jump in 1-3. Kind of. Fast build and other fast actions aren't the only benefit of playing on the Wii. This version of the game also has console-exclusive skips. Whether it's due to the hardware of the console or a genuine difference in the game, some rooms are able to be done much faster on the consoles, including the balcony jump. But to give even more credit to the Wii, there are skips that are literally exclusive to this specific console, not just consoles in general. Including an out-of-bounds jump in 1-5 that skips all of Room 2, leading you straight to the boss fight. I think it's important we take a moment and talk about out-of-bounds glitches in general in this game, and more or less how they function. Not only do out-of-bounds clips and jumps take you behind the walls of stages, they can also take you below. Below a stage, there are various different planes that act as ground beneath the floor. These planes are quite uneven, and one wrong step could send you through them to the void, which kills your character and resets you back in bounds. Because of the risk involved with falling out of the void, it's recommended that you stay along the very top out-of-bounds layer. So if you do end up falling, you can just press jump to re-land on one of the many layers. For a more in-depth look at how these out-of-bound planes function, check out this video by Gamago, a prominent runner and content creator for the game. Anyways, this was the first mainstream use of an out-of-bounds glitch in a run, and solidified the Wii as the fastest version of the game for the time. While the PC version of the game does have faster loading times, the amount of room skips that are available through the Wii and other console variants will far outweigh it. But a general improvement that can be seen in all versions of the game was a faster way to take care of 2-1. In this level, Indy is incapacitated, and you need to get an antidote so he's able to jump and assist you in pressing these two buttons. But instead, you can lure an enemy onto one of the buttons, press the other yourself, and accomplish the same goal. Later in that same level, a glitch dubbed Box Duping was implemented. There are certain characters in the game that have an extended animation when picking up boxes or crates, and if you switch characters during this animation, you can pick up the box they were in the middle of also picking up. This results in Character 2 spitting out a copy of that box that disappears very quickly. But if the box they spit out manages to land on a green plate, then it counts as the box being set down properly, while you still hold the copy. This lets you place down the second box on the other plate and skip having to do both puzzles. It's only used three times in the Any% percent run, right here in Shanghai Showdown, in 3-1 when building the X on the floor, and when building the Bulldozer in 3-5. Levels 2-4, 3-1, and 3-2 got some updated routes and jumps, with 3-1 utilizing an out-of-bounds jump, and in 3-2 jumping off a placeable object. Continuing that trend, 3-4 also gets a new skip, where in order to skip the first intended puzzle, Prince places down a box near the wing of the crashed plane, and uses it to jump over the wall that blocks your progression. Two levels later, and Prince finishes the run, with a final time of 2 hours, 7 minutes, and 30 seconds, a world record by a good amount of time. Put the thing on the thing. Two and a half seconds off. Alright, that was really good. This was a monumental run for LEGO Indiana Jones 1, as it showed that the game was a lot more than just a couple of trick jumps, and there was real potential for big things to be found. This sparked a higher interest in the game than we've seen previously, 
and the community got to work. On May 15th, a new runner claimed a 15-second record over Prince's last run. But Prince was able to take that back less than a full day later, setting yet another record on the 23rd of May, lowering the time down to a 2.03.39. With that, the time was quickly approaching the two-hour barrier. The breakthrough could happen at any moment now. Unlike in a majority of games that usually have two, three, maybe even four players battling it out for the glory, in this case, there was really only one contender to that throne. The prince himself. First try! Yes! No, but sub two. Yeah. One day after the 2.03.39, Prince would bring the record down to a 159.23, sub two by 37 seconds. This run changed a lot of things about how the game would be played going forward. It was found that dying to the boulder three times rather than completing the running section was actually faster, since dying on the third time auto-finishes the area for you. The second level as well was changed, with a jump off of the first generator allowing you to skip digging up the elevator platform and fixing the machine, and another very perilous jump being used to cross this gap in the fourth room. In this run, Prince had managed to get the jump first try, which even top runners today still struggle with. 1-2 gets a lot of special attention in the Any% percent run, mainly due to its high barrier of entry. It's one of the most difficult levels in the game, due to nearly every room having some kind of trick jump, with a couple not being far off from Pixel Perfect, but we'll touch on that in a bit. As I said, this sub 2 hour run was deserving of that title revolutionizing certain levels with skips that survived to modern day. Hitting a milestone like this did give the game a small uptick in popularity, with a new record holder coming to interrupt Prince's reign in December of that same year. The interesting thing, though, is that Asper played on the PC version of the game, which means they would need to have found some skips that save equal time to the console exclusives. And they did. For one, there was a jump in 1-1 that skips having to build the ladder. By jumping off of this ledge and into the wall, you can then jump off of one tiny piece of standable ground to just barely gain enough height to land back on the intended path. One of the biggest things found takes place in 1-3, a level we've been talking about quite a lot. It's a very, very long level, with room 2 taking up most of that time having you solve two separate key puzzles to open this door. But Asper wasn't going to let it slow them down. He was going to instead break the boundaries of this game. By using the windowsill's geometry as a platform, he was able to boost out of bounds, run beneath the door, then jump up into the transition zone. The first use of out of bounds in a PC world record. Oh, and in the following room, the one with the tricky console-exclusive balcony jump? Yeah, Asper found a way around that one too, but on the opposite side of the room. 1-4 now had the first boss skip of the run, and one of the first tricks in the level in general. 
Near the end of the level, you have to fight a boss that can only be damaged by torches. You get a stock of only two torches that respawn very slowly, which incentivizes Asper to find a way around it. If you dig up the monkey bars from this pile of dirt, the AI will try to grab onto the unbuilt monkey bars in order to meet up with you. If since they aren't technically there, it will default to the closest ones, which just so happened to be past the boss fight, letting you skip it in its entirety. Unfortunately, the out-of-bounds jump used in 1-5 isn't possible on PC, but you can still save time over the normal route of the level by using the box dupe glitch on the final gate, albeit still slower than the out-of-bounds jump. Mostly everything stays the same in the route used by Prince up until 2-3, which has a huge trick jump that saves off nearly a quarter of the level. Usually you have to walk to the far left side of the screen to grab a box, then drop below the cliff to grab another, and because the level is so huge, it's a decent amount of walking. But using some very difficult and very well-timed double jumps as Short Round and Indy, you can just barely make it on top of this decorative statue and up to the raised ledge, diminishing the need for any excess puzzles. Another new out-of-bounds clip can be used in the final level of Temple of Doom, though the movement needed is very perilous. You have to blindly maneuver your way around the thin ground along the level's border, and if you fall off, you risk clipping back in bounds and losing all of your progress. While Asper did die twice, he luckily didn't end up back in bounds, and successfully entered the door. Speeding along to 3-1, a new jump off the lowered bridge was shown to be faster than the previous route of running on top of the level. While this run did have an abundance of mistakes, it left room for improvement in the future. Though, Asper's improved run wouldn't happen. There was no way Prince was quitting the game that easily after all he had done. So, three months later, over the span of just 11 days, he would go on to set six new world records. Everything's out of my control now. Please, please, please. Yes? Sub 149 for the world record. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Completely saved that world record to RNG. <laughs> Sub 150 doable on Wii, you think so? I think maybe with a few more skips. This run, the 148, was the final run Prince would ever submit to the LIJ board, and he would go on to run other games in the series, leaving the any percent category open for someone else to take up the challenge. And half a year later, on August 15th of 2018, someone would. On that day, one of the most influential runners in this game's history, Hot Rod Zod, would submit a time of 1.49.49. But he wasn't playing on the Wii version of the game, nor was he playing on PC. He was running on Xbox One.
Zod was and is the only runner to ever play the game on this console, but he of course had his reasons. While some console-exclusive tricks carried over from the Wii, this version of the game had its own separate benefits. For one, load times were better than on the Wii, which is obviously a pretty big deal. Not to mention, the level geometry and the physics in some areas of the game don't function the same as others, leading to some interesting results. One of the big reasons that Zod's runs are so important is because of how they shaped the back half of the run over the front, making notable improvements in Movie 3 The Last Crusade, and even a decent amount in Temple of Doom. But it wasn't Zod's gamer skill that got him to this point. Around this time in the LEGO speedrunning community, there was a controversial debate taking place. A decision that sought to reinvent how a lot of these games were ran. The debate was over whether or not the any% percent solo category could use 1P2C, better known as 1 player 2 controllers. I talked about this a bit in my LEGO Batman World Record History video, so I'll try and keep it brief. 1P2C is a technique allowing a runner to use both the in-game characters at the same time, as long as they're only being played by one person. The general controversy here was whether or not this would still fall under the solo or one-player category, since you were controlling both players. Eventually, 1P2C was legalized in every LEGO game, but not without some pushback. That, however, is a story for a different day. It should go without saying how difficult this technique is to use, but slowly, Zod would begin to implement it into his runs. A good place to start is Zod's 142, where he not only uses a new out-of-bounds jump in 1-3 to skip having to fix the car, but also uses 1P2C to fix the eyes of the Sphinx in 1-4. Albeit a minor time save, it was definitely a good starting point for how it could be used to speed things up. After that comes 1-5, which holds my all-time favorite skip in the entire run. No more need for jumping out of bounds like Prince or fighting enemies for a disguise, because people soon realized that the loading zone for the door you're trying to get to extends just a little bit too far out on the left side, meaning all you have to do in this room is walk to the back corner and you're done. That's it. This accompanied by box duping the anvil with 1P2C is shaved a lot of time off this level. Then comes Temple of Doom, and right away we see some changes. Instead of using the enemy to press the button, you're able to jump and slide upwards against the slope of the stage, which makes Indiana teleport on stage, and is a much more reliable method. Immediately in the next room, another precise out-of-bounds jump is implemented to land in the transition zone behind the door. In 2-2, you can do yet another out-of-bounds jump to skip a whole lot of the level. If you continue to walk under the floor, you can make it all the way to the entrance of the cave. For now, that was all in Temple of Doom, but in the last crusade, we were far from finished. 3-3, Xbox players didn't need to wait for a disguise hat to spawn, as they could just jump around the first barrier. A new, non-exclusive jump to get the bazooka early was also implemented, making use of the wheelie function on the bikes. But something huge was about to change. It's something that would change the way runners looked at levels. 3-4, a level we've barely talked about. The reason being is there isn't much to note here. It's played out the exact same as a casual run, besides one minor skip. There are four main sections to this level. The blimp, the crash site, the car, and the beach. And for now, we're going to zero in on the beach. The beach is what really makes this level unique, as most end with you punching a boss or exiting a door. But this one ends with you... scaring birds. Normally, you hunt down three flocks of birds and then it's over. But for some unknown reason, there exists a trigger to end the level, right below the car near the start of the area. If runners could find a way out of bounds in this room, they could make their way to the trigger and end the level early. After a short while, an out of bounds jump was discovered, saving a surprising amount of time from watching all the bird cutscenes. 
Between that and the new unoptimized form of 1P2C, there was potential for some major time save. All that was left was to figure out what that might be. Instead of telling you, I think it's better if I just show you. Yep, it's time for another montage. You may have noticed scattered throughout those clips that there were a few new out-of-bounds areas that seemed to drastically cut down the time on individual levels. This can be seen most notably in 1-4, where runners figured out that there was a second transition zone present in the first room, one that warped you close to the end of the level. But why is that? Well, within the level, you actually play through the first room twice, once with Indy and Sala, and later on as Indy and Marion, once the arc is recovered. When playing through it the second time, the camera focuses in on a different side of the room, one wall to the right. Marion and Indy work together to smash a hole in the wall and climb on through, entering this catacombs-like area. It was assumed for a time that your second time being in room 1 was not really room 1, but just a copy of it, mimicking how it looked in the beginning. This was not the case. These two Room 1s are the same exact Room 1, meaning that if runners found a way out of bounds, they could trigger the transition on the right wall and skip every single section where you play as Sala, which is just about half the level. And it's not like it's a fast half level either. There was only really one trick used to speed up the Sala section, that being box duping in the Sphinx room and the Ark room. So if this skip was ever found, it would be one of the biggest in the game yet. And that's exactly what happened, but it wasn't easy. In order to accomplish this, they had to invent a whole new way to clip out of bounds. By turning off V-Sync in the game's menu. V-Sync is a feature that syncs a program's frame rate to the monitor that you're running it on, primarily for performance reasons. But runners found a way to abuse this. When your frame rate gets either too high or too low, the physics of the game itself start to change. This can lead to things like your character jumping higher or lower, and, uh, letting you phase through transition barriers. Yeah. So, transition barriers function as a two-dimensional plane, that when you walk through it, it puts you in the next segment of the level. But by allowing your frame rate to go uncapped, you can respawn your character in or behind that plane, allowing them movement where you otherwise wouldn't be able to move. This is done by punching the second character to death, moving to where they'll respawn, and then letting them get pushed behind the transition. In 1-4's case, this allows you to walk to where the transition is located for the second half of the level.
The box clip in 3-5 is similar, but instead of punching Indy near a transition, they use the box to push him through the mountain. All of these combined to create a hefty 136.05 on October 31st of 2019, which ended up being the final record Zod would hold. Take that with a grain of salt, however, as Zod hasn't written off this game for good. While he has no plans to make a return right now, the option is never off the table. Much like the times before, when one runner who dominates the scene decides to take their leave, another rises up to take their place, improving greatly upon the previous route. And this time was no different. Unlike the others though, which had month-long periods of rest, Zod's legacy would be quickly uprooted in less than one month. Enter Chimkin. Chimkin's runs were very different from what the community had seen in recent times. Choosing to run the game on PC instead of console, which hadn't been done in a world record run since 2017. With all the exclusive console skips, the PC runners would need to find something that would offset that time difference. And Chimkin was just the right person for the job. If there was one thing he was good at more so than any runners in the past, it was 1P2C. Where Zod took quite a few records to get comfortable with using it in minor circumstances, Chimkin used it at nearly every turn to gain the upper hand. And as we all know in a run as lengthy as this one, small things tend to add up. Being proficient with this allows Chimkin to play it safe in his first record, opting to not even use the elevator jump in 1-2, and instead use 1P2C to repair it. But playing safe isn't all that he did. If it was, this video wouldn't be half as long. Chimkin did something that no runner had yet considered. Chimkin changed the route. In his very first record, Chimkin finished movie 1 last opting to start movie 2 right after 1-4, and this was due to a change in a timing rule. Before this run, time was stopped after the ending of the final cutscene, but was just now changed to when you lose control of your character. Because the ending cutscene of movie 1 is the longest, it made sense to finish it last. That way you don't have to sit through it once you've already lost control of your character. In his own words, it also made sense to play through the last two movies earlier, since they're home to a large amount of the harder levels. The combination of the new timing rule, the route change, and great 1P2C execution led to a new record of 135.55 on November 25th of 2019. However, it was quickly beaten by another prominent LEGO speedrunner, Wii Super, just three days later by nearly a full minute. Both Chimkin and Wii Super run a lot of LEGO games, and are highly skilled in just about every classic one. So while this could have easily turned into a battle of territory, Chimkin shut that down very fast a week later with another minute and a half improvement. From there, time would slowly be chipped away as he got more comfortable with 1P2C. There were some small things discovered, sure, but nothing that we hadn't seen before. That was until November 13th of 2020. For starters, instead of leaving for movie 2 after 1-4, Chimkin leaves for movie 3 after 1-2, changing the route once again. But why? Is it because Last Crusade is that much harder than Temple of Doom? Well, it was about to become that way. Remember the transition skip used in 1-4? As it turns out, it was much more applicable than previously thought, as a similar method could be used in 3-1 to skip both the water room and the coffin room. If you use the same method as 1-4 to get player 2 out of bounds, you can jump behind the level's geometry and direct them towards the following room. If you line it up just right, the game will pop them up behind the gate you're intended to lower, triggering the cutscene and skipping two large rooms. It takes a lot of practice to get down, and Chimkin managed to get it on the first try. Immediately in the next level, another skip was discovered, allowing runners to bypass getting a disguise hat from an enemy. There's a gargoyle statue on an upper platform near the end of the level, which you're intended to push off the ledge for a minikit. 
but if you position your second player beneath it, when it lands on top of you, you'll clip through the wall and be able to go beneath the door that blocks where you need to go. Though, that's not all you have to do. Most transitions only work if you enter them from the intended side, and it just so happens that the transition plane for this area is inside of the door, meaning you can't just simply walk into it and be fine. You'll need to switch over to the character who's actually in bounds, and wait for the second player to try and warp back to you. Once the second player jumps, if you switch over to them, you'll be able to trigger the transition from inside of the door, sending you home free. I hope you didn't think we're done with new stuff in the third movie quite yet, because breaks aren't allowed. In the starting room of 3-3, by running one of the characters into the corner of the door and placing down a box on their position, it squeezes them through and allows them to hit the transition, but that wasn't all that was found that would completely break open this level. Besides the use of another skip around the first terminal, something major was enacted here. Something just as influential as 1P2C. It's called a drop and warp, or DIW. Drop and warps work by manipulating both the camera and player 1's position to drop in player 2 in unintended areas. There's a lot that goes into it, but for the sake of this video, most DIWs have you moving the camera to one of the two top corners, jumping off of something, then dropping in player 2. In 3-3's case, you can skip the entirety of the final room by jumping off of this turret into the corner of the wall, moving the camera to the top right corner of the screen, then at the apex of the jump, dropping in player 2 behind the door, skipping everything. But again, we still aren't finished with the last crusade. In 3-4, you can use the transition plane against the back of the car to go below the ground and land on that end level trigger, instead of having to clip out of bounds on the other side of the mountain. And the same can be done for the first room of 3-5. In that same level, an updated version of the box clip can be found as well. And that is why Rudders choose to play movie 3 first. I get a headache just thinking about it. The only new thing used in movie 2 of this run is another way to clip through the skull door in 2-6, which is done by just using a bush to push another character through. It's as simple as it looks. As you can now finally tell, the run had almost come full circle. There was just as much if not more thought put into the routing of the Last Crusade as there was for Raiders. It took a while, but the other movies were now getting a similar treatment. Though, Temple of Doom really hadn't had all that much discovered since the early days of Zod, and it was quickly becoming the slower of the three. What would it take for that to change? Let's take a step back for a moment. We've seen 1P2C in action, and we've seen a small glimpse of what its descendant DIWs are capable of. But are these two enough to bring the record down a substantial amount? With the right amount of testing and labbing out the tech, there could be some genuinely game-breaking tricks found for sure. But what if we pushed things even further? How much more broken can this game get? First run with the new lag stuff. More to come. This was the final frontier of large applicable discoveries when it comes to LIJ speedruns. Forget phasing through transition planes. What about moving through full physical walls? Nobody really knows what causes this to work, outside of a very basic understanding. It's currently thought that when you create arbitrary lag in your game, the most common method being alt-tabbing in and out of the program. The hitbox of your character snaps into whichever direction that you're holding, then quickly snaps back to prevent the character from just falling through everything. However, if you're sliding or being pushed into a wall when this occurs, the snapping effect gets overwritten, and you end up phasing right through. This theory may not be 100% correct, but it's the only understanding the community has. As Gamago would put it, we more understand where they work, but just not how. Regardless of that fact, things were going to get much, much crazier.
Oh, yes. Uh, probably a 25. Probably. If Chimkin had held the world record for two and a half years uninterrupted. He was the first record holder to implement DIWs, Expert 1P2C, Lag Eclipse, and a whole lot more into the run and the route. For all intents and purposes, it looked like nobody was going to be able to stand up to his level of skill and practice within the game. But we all know where this is going. So you had held the record for quite a long time. What was your reaction when you found out that Seed had taken that record? And how hard did you think it would be to take it back? When I first found out that Seed Gymnastic had taken record, I, I was, really wasn't that surprised. Um, he was a top level runner in a number of different LEGO games, and he has a really good practice mentality, which helps him get good at games very quickly. So when, I, uh, when he came back to the game, I knew there was a chance that he could take record. But he did end up taking it quicker than I expected. Uh, it kind of caught me off guard how fast he was able to get a uh, world record time um, and how big of his PB was when he did finally get it. Uh, but from that point forward, I knew I was going to have to grind pretty hard to get it back. Although he had only beaten me by 30 seconds, 30 seconds is quite a bit of time in LEGO Indiana Jones. Um, but at the time, the record was not as optimized as it had been in the past. There have been a lot of skips discovered recently that kind of put the limit of the category quite a bit ahead of record. So although he had beaten me and I knew it would be a bit of a challenge, I, I didn't have any doubts that I would be able to take it back from him. If Chimkin had held the record for over two years, what did it feel like to be the next record holder after all that time? It felt great. I don't want to discredit anybody by saying this, but Chimkin was the only runner that really cared about optimizing any person the last two years, and so it was super satisfying that I could be the person that finally beat his time. Did you at all expect this to happen, and how long did you think your record was going to stand for? I did not expect it. It wasn't even my goal at first. I have already run the game about 4 months earlier, however I was not satisfied with the PB I got back then, so I came back to the game to improve my time. Needless to say, I was kinda shocked when I beat the world record the first time, and obviously I didn't think it would last long. I expected it to be beaten within a week, but I was surprised when I checked Discord about 5 hours after getting my new time, and seeing that Chimkin had already beaten it. The week when it all went down was definitely the craziest week I've had in speedrunning. When you did get it back, was there a certain point you wanted to bring that time before taking a break? When I did end up getting the record back from him, I had a much better idea of where the limit of the category could be with all the new strats. And at that point, um, I felt like I could probably take my time down to sub 1.14.30. So that was what my new goal was at that time. When you were playing that run, the current world record, what was going through your head after you finished Temple of Doom? So coming out of Crusade, I knew it was on a pretty good run, but the PB I was comparing against, my 115.07, had the best ever single segment Temple of Doom that's ever been done to run in it. So I knew I had some pretty tough splits to compare against, but I did also know that there was some time save there. So I was nervous, but I definitely knew I could play well. And then I played Shanghai, Showdown, and Pancot, both very well. Both those splits were only a second or two off of my gold. And Pancot, especially, is a very stressful split with that room one skip that is pretty inconsistent. So getting that first try was huge. I then followed that up with a really good Temple of Kali that basically tied my gold and a very good Free the Slaves. So at this point, I would played the first four levels of Temple of Doom super well and I was coming in to escape the mines, which is a level that I have had inconsistencies with the past. And I ended up getting the lag clip and the jump into the trigger first try, which this was the first time I'd ever done both of those first try in a run. I golded that level by six seconds. Uh, so at this point, I realized this was like a crazy Temple of Doom I was on, and I just needed to finish off with a solid battle on the bridge, and I did just that, only three seconds off my gold. Um, so this single segment Temple of Doom was actually only 0.3 off of my sob from when I started the run, which is just absolutely crazy. So coming out of Temple of Doom, I knew I was on a run that was pretty much the best chance I would have to destroy the category, and I only had the one level left. Um, and I was a little bit nervous since last run, my last PB, when I got to opening the arc, 
I had lost 40 seconds on the tarp jump in room one. And I felt like I was in a very similar situation here compared to that last run, though obviously with a much better pace. But this time I got tarp jump second try, and then I got the jump off the pole in the next room first try, and at that point I realized I was pretty much in the clear to be solidifying a mid-113, absolutely smashing my goal time. Um, and I was still pretty nervous, but I was able to execute out the rest of the level uh, appropriately, and um, that's exactly what I ended up getting. What? 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 Dude! What? <laughs> There's no way! Oh my god. Oh, what? What? I don't, I don't even know what to say. Like, what? That's crazy. If we're gonna put like our analytical glasses on here, right? Like, these two splits were pretty mediocre. This one was pretty mediocre. And that's about it. This episode two is actually crazy. Like, okay, I lost 0.8 to my two one gold. 0.01, one one hundredth of a second to my Pancot gold. I don't think this actually was a gold, but it basically tied gold on 2-3. This is what, two seconds? Two seconds on Free the Slaves. I got a, a five or six second gold here. And then this was three seconds off. Like, what? We're gonna need something new. I I mean, I, I, I don't see a point in doing more runs. Like, I'm not gonna beat this. There's no way I beat this without some new thing. Like, oh my god. Chimkin's current world record is pretty insane. How long do you think it's going to take somebody to beat it? And do you have any plans to try? Honestly, I don't think it will be beaten. I would love to be proven wrong on this, but I just don't think it's going to happen. At least not with how the game currently stands. Some new insane skips would have to be found in order for Chimkin's run to be beaten. With that, I think you can already guess that I don't have any plans of trying to beat it, not unless some new discoveries are made. If someone ends up taking the record from you in the future, are you going to try and steal it back, or are you mostly satisfied with where you've brought the game thus far? I am pretty proud of my times in this game. It's a game I hold very close to my heart, so uh, if someone does end up coming back and trying to take the record, I will definitely continue to compete. Uh, I definitely want to try and continue holding record as long as I can. Um, and into the future, that will be what I try to do. Seven years, 58 world records, and eight record-setting runners. LEGO Indiana Jones may not have as expansive of a world record history as other popular speed games, but it still has its own story to tell. And I think it's far from over. The game has already been broken wide open, but runners are still finding new ways to apply old tricks and it's only a matter of time until a new record is set. It may be an old runner coming back to reclaim the throne, or maybe a current runner pushing themselves to the limit. Or maybe somebody entirely new, maybe one of you. However, for today, this is where the story stops. Thank you for watching the full world record history of LEGO Indiana Jones The Original Adventures.